Hello, I'm Tim Lindquist, and this is SER 321 Principles of um, Distributed Software Systems. Uh, today, <clears throat> we want to talk about uh, Unit 11, and that is uh, threading. Uh, and um, threading, there are a couple of sections out of, uh, there's a section out of uh, Java Network Programming 4th Edition, uh, Chapter 3 uh, covers threads. Uh, and then in the uh, Java Network Programming and, and Distributed Computing textbook, uh, Chapter 7 uh, covers multi-threaded applications. In terms of the class notes, we actually started last time looking at uh, runtime environments and talking about them and the relationship. Well, we spent more time on reflection, but also talked about the relationship between the runtime environment, the notion of a, of a processor, the activation stack, and how multiple threads can have uh, multiple processors conceptually uh, and share the uh, same runtime environment, same data state. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, actually take a look at threading in Java today. And we'll go through uh, some examples and some of the issues uh, that go along with it. So this is the section on threads. And I think we want to get to, I can't do it here. Uh, five point B point six or seven, I think is where we're headed. Yeah, right here. So let's start with five point B point seven. We didn't really talk about this last time. Uh, there are several issues that come up when it comes to using uh, multi-threaded programs. And as a matter of fact, um, several languages and several different approaches are, are trying to move away from using threads uh, and, and using uh, more efficient and less problematic, I guess uh, is the right way to put it, approaches. Uh, so synchronization uh, is, is one um, issue, uh, not so much a problem with threading, uh, but it is, is uh, an important aspect. In other words, uh, when we have multiple threads of control in the same program, uh, we may get to a point in execution in one of those threads where we don't want to go any further beyond that point until another thread gets to a certain point. Uh, so we want to be able to synchronize uh, their activities uh, in order to do that. And that's a, an important aspect of, of threading. Uh, and of course, that also relates to client server computing as well. Uh, but we're the threading, we're still talking about um, uh, multiple threads within a given program, a single program of execution. Synchronizing access to shared data is also <clears throat> a huge issue for threading. The reason it's such an important issue is because um, if we have multiple threads that are, if we just say two threads, that are sharing a, a single piece of data, a single object, uh, we want to make sure that um, one thread doesn't get suspended in execution uh, while that object is in an inconsistent state and then have another thread come in and make a change or expect it to be in a cons consistent state. So we'll actually take a look at a mechanism in Java and talk about uh, how we make sure those kinds of problems don't happen. I've already mentioned in class, and there are some, um, uh, some notes in here that go through the exact same thing. Uh, array lists are, are not, uh, java.util.arraylist is not thread safe, uh, but java.util.vector, which provides almost the exact same capability, uh, is thread safe. And then the same thing with hash map and, and other, uh, there's other um, collection classes as well. So uh, concurrency, uh, parallelism, asynchronous behavior, uh, if, if it's a single, if, if we are running on a single processor system, uh, then, then, in fact, we know that, that that single processor can't do multiple things at the same time, uh, at least not within the processor, right? And, uh, there may be uh, controllers, uh, disk controllers, and other things that can have uh, concurrent uh, parallel activities going on. But in terms of executing a program, uh, a, a single processor system has the, only the ability to execute one program at a time, so we need to switch back and forth, right? And that uh, uh, is the notion of uh, scheduling, uh, and, and it becomes a problem as well. Uh, with multi-core processors, uh, honestly, we're just getting to the point where we're starting to use them profitably, um, and threading is certainly one thing that uh, could be spread across different, uh, different cores. 
uh, implementing threads, uh, the underlying support for implementing threads uh, really depends upon the specific hardware on which it's running. Uh, and consequently, uh, you'll see that um, uh, to buy a runtime environment uh, that takes full advantage of an underlying hardware is generally a ex very expensive thing to do. Uh, and uh, frankly, at the university, we don't we don't deal with with uh, that level of performance requirements uh, or uh, fine tuning. Uh, so I'm saying if you go to work for somebody uh, where it's extremely important to take uh, full advantage of, of an underlying uh, operating system and, and hardware configuration, uh, then you may very well end up or that company may very well uh, end up uh, working with uh, another company to uh, make sure that the runtime environment takes full advantage of, of the platform. So let's go ahead and look at uh, threading in Java. And, and there really are two different approaches. Uh, the first approach is uh, to extend java.lang.thread. Uh, so, Java so if I want to have a class that is a thread class, um, meaning that I can create objects of that thread class that will be separate threads, uh, then I define my class to extend java.language.thread. And here's a very simple example. Class uh, prime thread extends thread. Uh, and uh, it has a, a method called run. Um, so the run method is where, uh, is where things get started. So if I want to create just one uh, prime thread, I would do it in this way. Uh, define the exact same way you declare any other object. Define prime thread P uh, to be a new prime thread of 143 and then say p.start and saying p.start uh, executing p.start will cause the run method to begin. So multi-threading uh, means that I create multiple thread objects. So if I created five different prime threads, maybe an array of prime threads or, or maybe just pqrs as different objects that are prime threads and started them, uh, depending on how long they run, they may all be running uh, presumably at the same time. So we can use uh, this approach uh, when uh, our thread class doesn't need to extend some other kind of class. <clears throat> There's another approach. <coughs> Pardon me, in terms of implementation, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, but um, in terms of the underlying uh, execution capability, uh, makes no difference. It's just that if our class has to uh, extend something else in Java, we can only extend one class. Uh, then, in fact, we can implement the runnable interface. And we do the exact same thing. We create a run method, a public void run method, and that's the, the basis for the execution of the thread. Of course, the run method can call anything else, create objects, do, it, do whatever it wants to do, uh, but uh, that's the focus or the, the, uh, the base of the execution of that particular thread. Uh, so we can do a class prime run implements runnable instead of extending. So uh, I would generally only do this if I had to extend something else. Uh, and we create it uh, almost the exact same way. Prime run P is a new prime run 143. <clears throat> and now th new thread of P dot start. All right. So um, there is uh, a constructor for thread um, that, that takes a runnable. Uh, and then after we've created that new runnable, uh, we then start the new runnable. So a little bit difference in terms of the way we get things started, but uh, within underlying it, uh, it's the exact same thing. <clears throat> so here are two, two examples of using threading. Um, the first one, yeah, might, so we might as well take a look at both of them. Let's, uh, we'll quickly uh, go through and execute both of them. The, the first one is in the context of a user interface. Well, they both are in the context of a user interface. The first one <clears throat> allows us to do multiple different operations and in the background copy a file. Um, and I've already uh, actually uh, downloaded these. Uh, and I mean, should be in the right direction. Yeah. So extract it and uh, change to that directory. Uh, so there is 
uh, three different files uh, for this one. One of them is a is a view class um, client GUI, uh, and then the uh, controller uh, is really um, temp convert client. <clears throat> the controller uses an auxiliary class uh, called temperature conversion. Uh, this just converts from Fahrenheit to, uh, to Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit. Uh, and that's all this class does. I believe it has just two, a, a parameterless constructor and then two uh, very simple methods that return, uh, take two doubles and re or take one double and return a double. <clears throat> the important part of this is that when we, um, uh, when, so temperature conversion, what's that to do with file copy? We, we're presented with three different options. Uh, one of them is to copy a file. Uh, and then the other, uh, the other two options are to do temperature conversion back and forth. And the idea is that if I do a file copy, I want it to be done in a background thread. And this uh, shows one mechanism for doing that so that in fact, um, uh, the, uh, the basic, the window application could continue to be active while the copy is taking place. And let's just go ahead and um, execute it. So it is a very simple user interface, um, and actually it was designed for calculator or something else, I don't know, where we pick a method up here at the top, <clears throat> and then depending on the method we picked, we will have figured, uh, filled in arguments. So converting from Celsius to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to Celsius, um, let's convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Uh, so 32 Fahrenheit, if we call the method, it says 32 degrees Fahrenheit is zero degrees Celsius and uh, minus 40 degrees uh, convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. It says minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit is minus 40 degrees Celsius. And in fact, if we take and convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, should get the exact same thing. Minus 40 degrees Celsius is minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's where those two uh, lines actually meet. <coughs> So the third option is to uh, copy a file. So when I select file copy and do call method, it asks uh, me to pick out a file. And let's, uh, let's go. Well, let's copy music thread students.jar. So now the, the uh, copy is taking place, and while the copy is taking place, uh, I should be able to continue to uh, use uh, the other methods in the UI. And I think intentionally this thing um, goes very slow in doing the, the file copy. Um, I don't know if it's completed, this, if there's a message that comes out and says that it's done when it does, but the idea is that file copy takes place in a different thread. So let's go ahead and Take a look at the code. Uh, so here's temp.jar. That's the, the result of doing the file copy. And um, let's go into the source directory. Here's the, this is the, the primary uh, worker for, for all of this. So this is the controller. Uh, so similar to uh, FLTK <clears throat> in Java, uh, we have a button uh, that exists on the user interface. So there's an action perform method and the class uh, implements action listener. Uh, so we also have a, a copy file uh, and copy file class. is a thread class and it's actually uh, a nested or it's in the same file uh, not nested within um, uh, the uh, temp convert client class uh, but it's an auxiliary class defined in the same file 
and you can see that the class copy file extends thread. Uh, and in action performed, Uh, just go down here to where we find out that it's copying a file. Uh, so this is the else clause that, uh, up above it, the if then uh, and the uh, first else uh, <clears throat> takes care of converting from Fahrenheit to Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit. Uh, but this one shows you how to do the file chooser. Um, so there's uh, within swing a file chooser, J file chooser, chooser new file chooser, uh, and it sets it at the current directory, sets a couple of um, attributes of the file chooser, and then um, chooser.show open dialog. All right, so that's uh, what's going to choose a file for me. <clears throat> and if the return value is a file chooser.approve option, in other words, if it didn't get canceled by the user, uh, then uh, copy file is a new copy file, so I'm creating a new thread uh, and chooser.get selected file and then uh, copy file dot start. Right? So that uh, creates a new thread for me <clears throat> and I'm going to save a reference to it in the object, in the temp convert client object. Uh, and the, the body or what actually happens uh, in the um, In the copy file thread, uh, you can see uh, all it does is to create, uh, it opens up the file uh, that comes in for input, and then it actually makes a copy of it in uh, temp, <coughs> right in the file temp. Where's the output stream? Temp plus the extension. So it should be uh, temp uh, dot, and then in this case, it was a jar, I believe. So uh, this um, uh, run method uh, runs as a separate thread. In this case, uh, everything else within this program can continue executing and, and taking care of the user interface. Uh, so the important thing about um, uh, user interface programming is, um, although it's not enforced by some uh, toolkits, uh, it is enforced uh, by others. Uh, so in Android or in iOS, uh, if you try and do uh, network connections uh, or file I.O. on uh, the user interface thread, uh, then in fact it will generally uh, generate an exception uh, or something of that nature, or even at compile time it won't allow you to do it. You actually have to uh, create a separate thread in order to do it. So here's an example of doing just exactly that. And then the other one I want to show you Uh, is music. Uh, so this one uh, built into Java without FX is the ability to play wave files. And the reason it took so long to extract that is because it has a couple of wave files in it. Uh, and um, this is also an example of uh, using um, documentation, Java docs, uh, and the uh, live uh, class, <clears throat> the view classes are stored in uh, a jar file in the live directory. So the live directory has music GUI jar and jar tvf uh, live music GUI, music GUI jar. And you can see uh, the uh, music library GUI uh, class is inside of that uh, jar file. Uh, so it has to be included in the class path. Uh, so now uh, so there's only one uh, controller source file. And that's the music thread itself. So, so let's go ahead and execute it. So the controller in this case actually uh, again shows a different, another uh, manipulation of a J tree uh, and uh, basic swing components. 
And in this case, uh, it makes a, a tree that uh, just has um, the nodes uh, related. So uh, one of the songs is uh, by Iz, uh, a Hawaiian singer who passed away a while ago. Uh, and the other one is uh, one of Jimmy Buffett's very old songs, uh, Come Monday. Uh, they're both WAV files. So now you can see you can um, uh, select them. And when you select it, it goes over here. Uh, under music, we can actually play it. And while it's playing, uh, we can continue to do uh, selecting. So it's playing as a background thread. And as I, as I mentioned, um, with, uh, with Java, uh, before FX, there was the ability to, to play uh, WAV files, uh, but not MP3 files. It's a different codec in order to do that. <clears throat> and that's what this takes advantage of. So uh, instead of, uh, so in this particular example, if you're interested, it shows you uh, how do you manage and use um, those classes within Java. Uh, they're still there, uh, even though there's now FX, uh, they're still there and you can use those classes to, to uh, start running uh, and playing a, a music clip. Um, okay, so I'm not actually, uh, I guess I'll just take a very quick look at the code for that, uh, the controller code. Uh, so music thread extends uh, music library GUI, right? So music library GUI. Uh, is in that uh, jar file. It's a pre-compiled uh, uh, class. Uh, and uh, so it, it is the view uh, that you saw that has the JTree and so forth with it. The exact same thing that you're doing in assignment six. Uh, and then uh, music thread is the controller class. Uh, we do the wire ups. We uh, do the um, uh, constructor for uh, super. Uh, so music thread or music library GUI. Uh, and then uh, wire up for the menu items, uh, tree uh, selection listener, and tree will expand listener. And then we set the GUI to visible. Um, this is a JFrame uh, since um, music library GUI uh, actually extends JFrame. Then, in fact, uh, uh, that makes the whole thing show up. Uh, and the more important thing here is the thread. And the thread class down here, play wave thread extends thread. So this, uh, so in action performed, uh, it creates an instance of play wave, uh, play wave thread, and then starts that instance. Uh, and it uses, um, I should actually show you the, the packages. Um, it uses a, a data line class, uh, audio stream, uh, audio system, get audio uh, input stream, uh, and then I give it the name of a file, uh, the WAV file that we're playing. Uh, and, and then um, you can uh, create a source line uh, for it. Uh, you can start, stop, pause, resume, and so forth, uh, that uh, source line. Uh, so this doesn't have any controls, but in fact, you could provide controls from that source line. You can find out um, the total length, the duration of playing the clip. Um, so you can uh, show a progress bar. Uh, the swing controls have a progress bar. So you can do manually create all the controls that you want to as part of, uh, as part of this um, uh, set of capabilities that are built into Java. Okay, so let's leave it at that. Um, let's go back here. So again, the idea is that we, we have music playing in the background. And... Let's get rid of it and go back here. Uh, so um, threads have states. Uh, and when you create a thread, uh, it goes into a new state, um, uh, a new thread state. 
when you destroy a thread, it goes into a terminated state. Uh, and then uh, when you start a thread, it goes into a runnable state. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's all that it is running as soon as you start it. It means that the state of it is runnable, and that means it's eligible to be run or eligible to be uh, scheduled. Uh, uh, these arcs are labeled by methods that exist within the thread class. Um, although I think they've removed destroy, um, uh, but there is still wait, uh, join. Um, I don't know about park anymore. Uh, there's a sleep. All right. Uh, so each of these uh, different um, states, uh, the transition from state to state, uh, is based upon methods that exist within the thread class. Uh, so a very convenient thing, without having even creating a separate thread, uh, you can cause any thread to block uh, for, in this case, uh, at least two seconds, uh, 2,000 milliseconds. Um, if I, so if I say thread.sleep uh, 2,000 milliseconds in uh, the main thread of a program, it'll block, uh, allow something else to execute, and then at least two seconds later, it'll uh, come back and, and execute whatever statement comes after thread.sleep. <clears throat> uh, a very common uh, construction for threading is the join method. Uh, so, in fact, if I have multiple threads, or even if I just create one thread and start it, um, I can join with that thread. And, and I mentioned earlier this notion of synchronizing. Uh, that's what join does. Uh, so I'm going to wait. at uh, If I'm uh, the, the thread that does the join, I'm going to sit at that join method until the other thread uh, completes. Right? So it waits for another thread to complete. So I'm not going to go past this point until that thread completes, meaning that something that I'm about to do depends upon another thread being done. Uh, there's also priorities that are available, uh, 1 to 10 priorities. Uh, and uh, we can also um, use a, a volatile modifier. Um, so in a, in a uh, multi-CPU uh, type of an environment, uh, we make sure that we don't get cached. Uh, and, and consequently, um, if we're not cached, we make sure we, we uh, read the data back uh, every time that it gets used. So uh, one of the biggest issues about threading is shared data, uh, concurrent access uh, to uh, the same information. Uh, so it's, it's very straightforward to create multiple threads um, that have access to the same uh, object, um, you may pass that a reference to that object in as, as part of the constructor for the thread uh, or any of another other mechanisms available. Uh, if within uh, a given um, thread class, uh, uh, well, you can create multiple threads uh, and, and they can access the same data object. So the problem uh, comes in uh, when those threads are using an object uh, that is not uh, thread safe. Uh, so here's, as I've already mentioned in class before, uh, array list and uh, hash map, um, two of uh, Java's um, collections uh, classes are not thread safe, but they do have corresponding uh, classes in uh, the collections uh, API that are thread safe. Uh, so array list and vector um, not thread safe and thread safe. Uh, hash map is not thread safe and hash table is thread safe. So what does it mean to be thread safe? It means that if two, th two or more threads are sharing the same um, hash table, then in, in fact their access to that hash table will be synchronized. Meaning that if one of them is in the middle of doing a put into the hash table, um, that uh, put will not be interrupted by another thread. In other words, if I'm in the middle of doing a put, my hash table may be in an inconsistent state, right? And there's no guarantee that even though I uh, even though I write a single uh, statement, um, you know, a put statement, uh, my hash uh, dot put uh, key comma value, it, it may take a hundred statements in order to execute it. And if during those hundred statements um, my thread gets blocked or suspended and another thread comes in and executes, 
uh, then it may be that my hash table, or in this case hash map, uh, is in an inconsistent state. Right? I might have already uh, put information in there uh, and, and not, have, not have given it the complete key value or something along those lines. Uh, actually, there's another example. There is an example using a stack. Uh, a a um, uh, array implementation of a stack is a, is a good example in the uh, class notes that describes the same, <clears throat> same sort of a situation where if one thread is in the middle of doing a push onto the stack, but the stack pointer hasn't been altered yet, uh, if, it gets, uh, if that thread gets blocked and another uh, thread comes in and uses that same stack, well, before the uh, uh, top of the stack or the stack pointer uh, gets uh, modified, then in fact the stack may uh, be inconsistent in uh, the values that one of the threads would see. So uh, Java has a very simple example or a simple way of uh, forcing synchronization. So you uh, can actually um, create a data structure yourself, uh, create a a class uh, where an instance of the class is going to be used by multiple threads and provide your own thread safety or synchronization for it. And the way you do that uh, is by using the synchronization modifier. Uh, so um, let's see. So here's this is giving you an example of uh, uh, how a stack can be in an inconsistent state. And this is the uh, synchronized. So uh, if I wanted to um, make my implementation of a stack um, synchronized, thread safe, I would use the synchronized modifier, public synchronized void push uh, in my implementation. So I'm doing uh, my stack impl dot, uh, Java, uh, and I create a push method in it that I'm going to provide the body for it. Uh, then, in fact, I just say it's uh, synchronized. My push is synchronized. And that means that any time a thread um, is able to call or starts calling the push method, no other thread will interrupt it uh, to execute any it or any of the other synchronized methods in that class uh, until it completes. All right, so um, this protection is built uh, based upon a single object. So if I have two different threads and two threads are accessing the same stack, same stack object, <clears throat> then in fact synchronized has a monitor that checks to make sure that I, uh, if one of those uh, threads is executing the push, that the other thread won't interrupt it. The, the first thread will complete the push before the second thread is able to get in and, uh, and access the stack. On the other hand, uh, maybe the same class stack but I may create two different stack objects, and it's just uh, perfectly fine for uh, uh, separate threads to access separate objects. So I'm not talking about classes. I'm talking about instances of classes. Uh, so, so in fact, each instance of a class, uh, when you use the synchronized modifier, each instance of a class, each object of a class, has its own monitor, and that monitor assures that multiple threads do not access um, or, or do not interleave in their execution of the synchronized methods. And so it goes all across all synchronized methods. In other words, if one thread is doing a push uh, and another thread comes along and wants to do a pop at the same time on a single stack object, um, the, the uh, thread requesting the pop operation will not be allowed, uh, because of the monitor, will not be allowed to execute the pop until after the push has completed. And, and it only makes sense because the, the, uh, the, if, if, the thread, if the second thread was allowed to execute pop, uh, the stack may be in an inconsistent state. So uh, when should you use um, the synchronized modifier? Uh, well, the answer to that, when should you use a, a monitor or the synchronized modifier uh, when uh, there are two or more threads and at least one of those threads modifies a shared object or shared data, right? So if I have multiple threading and I have the ability to share an object, uh, then if any of those threads may modify the object, 
then all of the methods, whether the methods just access it or make a change to it, all of the methods um, uh, that access that shared data should be synchronized. And here's an example of, a, um, uh, of multiple threads that share data. Um, it shows you more the, the pragmatics of doing it than actually an execution uh, demonstrating anything important. Uh, but nevertheless, let's just take a very quick look at the, um, at the code for it. And we will complete with that. So extract it, ant. And in this particular case, it creates uh, several threads. And those threads, uh, every time they access or modify a, a piece of information, uh, then in fact, they, they uh, indicate that they've done that. So I've got thread one, thread two, thread three, and thread four. Um, so uh, I've started each of those threads and I'm sharing data between those. So this example shows you how you can take an object and share it. In this case, it's, it's uh, a value, an integer value, I think. Uh, shareable data with a value of 25 is accessed by thread one uh, and accessed by two, three, and four. So let's just take a quick look at the code for this. So the constructor, um, I'm sorry, here's the, the main method is up here at the top, synchronized threads, uh, the main method shareable data, uh, the data item. So it creates an instance that's going to be shared. Uh, and uh, so the data item actually, uh, we create four threads here, a thread T is a new a thread, uh, and I pass uh, the data item to that thread. Uh, and do uh, t dot start right uh, so t start starts those four different threads in their execution uh, so I create four instances of the a thread class uh, and that a thread class has uh, a data object All right so since that data object was created in the main method uh, it sits out there on the heap and the and the anchor for it is in the main method uh, I'm not really cop copying that that object, uh, when I create new threads, I'm passing a reference to it. So there is indeed one shareable data object and all four of the threads are sharing that object uh, and consequently they have to be synchronized, right? So here is the class of the thread class uh, and it goes through and it does the data.access and then uh, it'll also call the increment method as well, which makes a change to it. So since uh, each of those threads both access and share it, we must synchronize all of the methods in this shareable data class. And here they are. Um, actually, it could be public synchronized or synchronized public. Synchronized public access it. Uh, so this is just getting uh, the value of it. Uh, and uh, synchronized public increment. And this is incrementing the value. It's uh, nothing more than an int. So shareable data is a class that wraps an int, uh, uh, an int value and provides the ability to get its current value uh, and or increment it. Right? So this shows you how you would use uh, the synchronized modifier uh, and, and uh, uh, use it for all of the methods that either access uh, or modify the shared data. Okay, let's leave it at, at that. Uh, so again, you can see this thing uh, goes through and every time uh, any one of the threads uh, accesses the data, uh, it actually prints out a message. And I think each of the threads go through uh, within an iteration. Um, yeah, for int count equals zero, count less than three, count plus plus. So each of the threads uh, do multiple uh, accesses uh, and one, uh, one increment for it. So if the count's less than two, just access the, the data. And if the count is um, not less than two, so it's going to be three, 
uh, then go ahead and increment it. So there's an example that shows a very simple uh, threading uh, and uh, multiple threads sharing uh, the same data object. Okay, so I think uh, the next thing is, uh, it's called conditional monitors. Uh, you can actually do uh, conditional blocking. So here's an example uh, of a, a class called bank that has methods uh, to withdraw and deposit information from the bank. Uh, so have you ever been overdrawn? Uh, this one, this class uh, uh, would, does not allow an account to be overdrawn. Uh, and the way that it, um, so multiple threads uh, may share the same account. Uh, while amount is greater than balance, uh, it waits, right? So if I try and do a withdrawal, not only is this method synchronized, but in addition to that, um, uh, the wait um, method, uh, the wait, um, uh, yeah, the wait method in the thread class uh, allows me uh, to um, uh, to suspend until. Uh, so this is not is not a busy form of waiting. It suspends until the amount that I'm requesting is greater than the balance, right? Uh, isn't that backwards? Should be the balance is greater than the amount. Uh, so I think I've got this coded backwards, but that's a, that's just my coding, right? Oh, no, no, that's right. While the while the amount is greater than the balance, then wait, and then when the amount is no longer greater than the balance, the amount that I want to withdraw is no longer greater than the balance, then allow it to, uh, to be withdrawn, right? So this is it's called conditional monitors, and it's a special form that allows you to to uh, release even even though the method is synchronized and I allow one of the threads to get in and execute it <clears throat> it may be that there's a condition that says well you know what I didn't really want that thread to get in here uh, so I can use that conditional monitor in order to guard and and suspend the thread who has, has actually gotten the key to execute withdraw uh, until the time that I want that thread to, to have access to it and this, that's the mechanism that's provided by a conditional monitor in Java. And I think that uh, is the end of that section. Yeah, so now uh, the rest of this is about using um, monitoring and threading in C Sharp, and, and we're not going to cover that. So I'm going to leave it at that for today. That is the end of um, the section on threading, unit number 11. Uh, and then the last thing that we'll talk about is uh, sockets. Uh, and we're going to go back to uh, the section next time. In the next video, we'll talk about the last part of sockets, uh, where we combine together um, TCP IP connection-based sockets together with threads and take a look at some sample servers.